the first time someone talked to me about so bright, coming today, what the request was is could I do um, sort of some clinical work? Could I take the, the youth who are struggling with problems of cancer and do some art therapy and then bring that artwork to the parents and have a dialogue? I said, no, I, I can't do that. When you hear Luke's story today, I think it'll put it in perspective why. You can't, with people that, who you don't know, who've had uh, such pain, physical and emotional, have them in a room with art materials and open them up emotionally with no therapeutic alliance with them, and then, not, then uh, expose them <laughs> by talking about what they did with family members. So I, I think that uh, your presentation, Luke, puts a backdrop on that, that to do any kind of art or art therapy is an opening, personal, revealing process. And when all of us have undergone different kinds of pain and, uh, in our lives, and uh, it's very powerful. So I think that fits into the, the talk. A lot of people over the years would say to me, you know, could you go and see this person, just do a little bit of art with them? A little bit of art therapy? Well, you can't do just a little bit of something. It's actually disrespectful. So instead of that, we decided that I would uh, try to give a presentation about uh, what's involved in art therapy and show some examples uh, of different art that people have done. Um, let's see. And so... I just say, hey, please don't photograph any of the artwork of uh, folks who I've seen or record uh, the conversations about the client's artwork, although I gather this is going to be live streamed. The photographs won't go on that. So when we have conversations about the pieces, I'll just have to be very mindful of that. I also hope that we'll have a chance to have a little bit of dialogue, which is hard in this room. Um, and I, because I am not allowed to move around because it's being uh, filmed. So I can't get more intimate than standing up here. So, but if you don't ask me questions, I'll just talk forever. So I would welcome questions and dialogue so that it can have some meaning for you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what art therapy is. Um, it's based on some of these assumptions that all, a belief that everybody is creative and that we all have that. You don't have to be an artist to do art therapy. In fact, in a way, it's almost um, a hindrance for some people if they're really good at the technical part of art because they get wrapped up in the technique and wanting to do something that looks right and that it has to be okay rather than using the tool as a tool for expression and communication. So when, when we create through art, it allows us to have an increased awareness. It allows us to express our needs, feelings, choice, and it also gives a sense of mastery and control, that you're, it's something that people are in charge of. Um, the other piece that's really important, a lot of my training was in narrative therapy, which is a process where you externalize problems from people's lives. And art lends itself very nicely to externalizing problems. Because when you externalize a problem, it becomes out there. You can develop then a relationship with that problem. It's sort of like the difference between saying um, somebody's schizophrenic or somebody's a person dealing with schizophrenia. So what is art therapy? It's, it's a therapeutic approach where you're blending the knowledge and skill of art and therapy. And it's aimed at uh, well-being. That's the main purpose, right? To increase well-being and, and uh, make people feel better, that uh, social emotional adjustment. And again, it all depends on uh, how motivated people are and what they want to work on and what they want to improve in their lives. So the central focus that's different from other kinds of therapy is that uh, it's around the creative process of doing the art is, is the vehicle. Uh, the primary thing though, and I'll talk a little bit about this later as well, is that it occurs within a therapeutic relationship of trust and that's paramount, that's really important. Um, and the therapist 
is kind of like a guide, I would describe it. But there are goals. It's not just a free-form process. There's a purpose and, and a focus. I like to think about art therapy in kind of three different ways. There's the person doing the art, the client that, who is the author, the artist, and you're also the audience of your own art when you're making something. It makes people feel vulnerable when we do something where we're sharing something of ourselves. We're taking a risk to reveal ourselves when we do that kind of work. And a lot of people, I said, worry that they'll say, well, I'm not good at art. It's the other, like professionals will say, well, see them for art therapy because they really are good at art. And then other people will say, well, I'm not good at art. I don't know if this could help me. Um, and so the medium itself, that's where you have to work with that. And then the therapist is that guide, but also is a witness observer to what's going on. And the art piece itself is that means uh, for expression and is full of meaning. But the meaning needs to be the artist's meaning and not the meaning of anyone else looking at it. And I take a lot of time at the beginning if I'm doing art therapy with someone to explain this because that's one of the vulnerabilities that people feel is you're going to judge me. You're going to think I'm really messed up when I do this or you're going to think something about me in some way. If What I explain to people is that whenever we look at a piece of art or we listen to a song, we project our own stuff on that. It's nothing about what the person who wrote the song meant or the artist who was doing it. All we see is our own projection unless we ask the person who's done the piece to tell us. And I'm sure you've had that experience with music. I know I have. You listen to a song, then you hear what the, uh, the songwriter was writing about, and it may or not be anything about what you've projected onto that song. So it's very important, and that's another reason that I didn't want to do the process that was originally requested, because when someone shares their art with someone who wasn't present and doesn't have the opportunity to share exactly what it is about, then the others, the audience of who you're sharing that with, project all kinds of stuff onto it. And you wouldn't have time to go through that. People would go away with their own impressions. And I've done tons and tons of workshops for professionals over the years, and they're the worst at it. They want to project, oh, that means this, and blah, 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 and it's, it's not necessarily true at all. So the art part, the art knowledge, has kind of three main areas. One is the content, the other is the process and the form, and I'll talk a bit more about those. In the content, you're looking at what are the themes that are discussed? What are the ideas? What are the feelings? What's the content matter in the, in the piece? And when you see repetition in a person's art over time, whether it's form or content, that's when you start to get a sense of significance, when people go back to things. It's like anything that we do when there are patterns, um, that those patterns uh, may have some uh, meaning to the person doing them. The process is very similar to all types of therapy, that it's, uh, you're looking at how people are, what's their comfort level before, after, during the art, are they worried, what are they thinking, um, what's their experience doing it, um, like their, their feelings at the time, their verbal and nonverbal communication, uh, usually there's some kind of verbal debriefing process, some conversation about the art. Um, the relationship with the therapist over time is part of the process. Uh, and that you can't just say, well, someone has rapport. Rapport is a, a fluid thing. It can come and go. Um, the comfort with the media over time is part of the process. So someone may be very uncomfortable with certain media, but then may uh, learn to master certain things and explore and create and try things they haven't tried before. Part of the process is also the time that you spend on different parts of a piece, which is important. So let's say there's a, a piece of paper and someone's doing uh, some kind of uh, visual picture, uh, say an abstract or something, they may spend tons and tons of time on one part of that picture. So one part may have a lot more significance than the whole. So again, if you're just looking at the whole and you weren't there for the process, 
you may not be aware that this particular part had had more meaning. Uh, the style, the structure, directive or non-directive is part of the process. Um, the structure of who you see, how often, how long the sessions are, all that stuff is part of the process. Whether you're seeing an individual, a family or a group. Uh, when you're doing a group also, um, it's way more complicated than seeing an individual because you're dealing with the dynamics of the people with each other, you don't know what their relationships are, do they feel safe in the group. It's much more complicated and uh, less safe for people than doing something one-to-one. -one. Uh, and then the other piece of the process is you have beginnings, middles, and ends in every session. So in the hour, you have a, a beginning part, a middle, and an end. And then you have the process over time. So if you're seeing someone for a month or a year, you have the beginning parts of, of what you're doing. Then you have a middle phase, and you have an ending and a termination and saying goodbye. The hardest part for therapists uh, doing art therapy who are not artists uh, is the form. And people who go into art therapy tend to come from two roots. They either come from being an artist primarily or primarily being a therapist and then work to kind of blend them. So the people who are trained more in therapy rather than art, like the people who are trained in art, they're going to have to learn more about the process stuff. The people who are trained more in therapy have to learn more about the form. And so the form is are things like this media, uh, the organization of the art, the use of color, uh, lines, how people use shapes and relationship in space, uh, the placement of pieces on the page, the size, intensity, clarity, completeness, uh, whether things are restricted or expansive, uh, simple or complex, whether there's balance or uh, uh, whether things are age appropriate. That's another thing. There's a whole developmental sequence in art that we learn at certain ages how to, let's say, draw a person. So you can't draw conclusions about something if a child hasn't learned to, let's say, draw feet and hands yet. Or when kids are little, they draw actually really big hands and big feet. Like So they, there's a whole process of how they learn to draw. And you need to be aware of all that or else you can draw some pretty weird conclusions. And how people use symbols. There's a whole host of... Um, theory about the use of symbols. Um, Jung, who was a, a therapist, a psychoanalytic therapist, developed all this stuff about symbols. You can buy volumes of books about the meaning of symbols. And I actually don't think for me and how I work that it means anything. To me, what the person doing it says that it means is what it means. But I remember really early in my training, I would go to these books and there's all kinds of stuff you could read about someone who does this, what that particular symbol means. And uh, I just, now I find it terribly disrespectful as I learn from people who uh, create their art. So the dimensions of art, I used to say that it was relaxing and pleasurable. And now I say it may be relaxing and pleasurable. That's an assumption that we make oh, they're young, you know, they should like art, you know. And, but that's not necessarily true at all. There's a lot of people who really dislike art, feel very uncomfortable with the medium, medium and do not find it relaxing and pleasurable. It doesn't mean that they couldn't use it in a therapeutic way, but that assumption may not be real at all. Um, and again, lots of kids get put in that category. Well, they're kids, they must like art. But I'm sure if you looked at everyone in this room, there's probably some people who are comfortable with it and some people that absolutely hate it. So it is non-intrusive, though. Again, if, if somebody finds this a comfortable thing to do, uh, it can feel non-intrusive. And the reason it's non-intrusive is that the person who's doing the work is the one who's in charge of what they do or don't do. Except some people, especially when I worked uh, many, many years with eating disorders, um, some people who develop that problem are really good people pleasers and will do something even if it makes them uncomfortable because they think it's expected or that it's to make somebody else happy and not themselves. So that's not very therapeutic. Um, it is voluntary, it's universal, it, 
it crosses all cultures and uh, it's flexible and changeable, which I really like because you can you can shift it. You can ask people to add things to their work and you can change uh, what's there. It doesn't have to be. People can rip it all up if they don't like it. They can color over it. They can, you know, it's, um, and it allows for third-person conversations. So if someone is, um, finds it very difficult to talk about their own situation, but they do a piece, you can talk about what's going on in the picture. You know, what's happening with, if someone, let's say, did a representational piece where they drew an animal or sculpted something, you can talk to them about, gee, I wonder what that, you know, dog is feeling in this situation. Or So you can talk with a little bit of distance. You don't always have to talk about that this is you in this situation. And it, so it adds a visual component to conversations. And in doing that, it precipitates some conscious awareness. So sometimes people will do things, and they don't have a clue. They just, I have no idea what that means to me at all. And so you can explore it. And as you explore it, especially if you're looking at things over time, you can see patterns. And you might say, well, you know, remember you, you used that, that image in a whole bunch of other stuff. Why don't we look back and see or use those colors? You know, are there any patterns that you see? And so helping people to bring things into conscious awareness. Another thing that I really dislike about um, some of the uses of art therapy is, again, this psychoanalytic approach uh, where uh, some people strongly believe that uh, we're always dealing with the unconscious and that these pieces uh, that people do have some meaning that they don't know about and then start to project and make assumptions. Again, I find that disrespectful because to me, if something's not in our awareness, we can't deal with it. How can we deal with something that is unconscious? We all have stuff that we do and we don't know why, which we can explore, but if, if it means something that the person doing it doesn't know, it's just guesswork. It's just, you know, it, uh, it's not helpful in my view. So it can also be a bridge to that conscious awareness or to talking about something, and it can be a non-destructive way to discuss and to express very difficult uh, feelings sometimes. And it's action-oriented. So if somebody's doing something, like Luke, you were talking about uh, depression and, and feeling you know, lost and things. Well, when you do something that's action-oriented, it gives us a feeling of empowerment that there's something you have control over. This I call the framework for freedom, which is really about the alliance. So you need to set the stage for, um, for the sessions to be useful. You have to have a trusting relationship. That's absolutely number one. You have to build the trust. And you have to have confidentiality. That's why I was saying about having an audience. As soon as we make something that's going to have an audience, doesn't matter if it's family who you're really close to or if a teacher is having you do something, they put it on the wall, there's an audience. And that will change what we do. So in, over the years uh, in the inpatient part of the eating disorder program where I worked, there was a constant pressure, constant, to could we please put some of the artwork on the walls? Could we please show, you know, and they do it in a well-meaning, with a well-meaning intention, that we want to value this work, we want to value the people, and we want to value the process, but it actually does the opposite. So as soon as you say, well, you know, we're going to do something today, and uh, we're going to put it on the wall, well, that's going to absolutely change what you do. You will not do something therapeutic. You'll do something pretty and, you know, that you don't feel you could be judged about or whatever. Um, so that confidentiality is really important and the privacy uh, of people's work. You also have to have space where there's a minimum distraction, which is very difficult in a hospital setting. Um, people will barge in and, you know, when I used to see people on inpatient medical units make big signs and, you know, do not disturb and still somebody would, you know, come in and uh, be disrespectful. You also have to have some appropriate space. You can work with a lot of flexibility, but you have to try and have something to be able to use the materials that you're using. Um, 
and you need to have a range of materials, you know, from things that are very controlled to things that are messy to things that aren't just drawing and painting. That involve. One of my favorite mediums is actually construction paper. It's very portable, it's very easy to use, and it's incredibly creative what people will make out of construction paper. But it gets seen as a childish thing so that school influences us a lot about art. If you're thinking now about when you did art and if you're not an artist and you haven't done art for a long time, most people think of school and it's often a very negative experience where people are evaluated. And in early grades, they do things like construction paper or finger painting. And they're such good tools, so people have to get past those kind of mediums and see the potential. And once they do, it's amazing things that you can make and designs and colors and stuff with construction paper. And it's pretty foolproof too. Like you want to have mediums that uh, decrease your, increase your sense of competence really. So you don't want a f situation where someone could fail with the medium. So construction paper is great that way. So you also need to have limits and structure. So uh, again, that's age appropriate as well. Uh, you can't destroy the materials. You know, we have time limits, all kinds of things. Um, you need to be very clear with people, the purpose, why we're meeting. You have to be honest and transparent, and that's part of that alliance. Again, I would have people over the years say, well, don't tell them it's therapy. You know, they, they won't do it if you tell them that's therapy. Just say, you know, you're going to come and do some art with them. And I'd say, but that's dishonest. It's not true. How can you build a therapeutic alliance if you're doing something secretive? You're actually trying to do therapy with them, but you're pretending you're not? So you have to be congruent with building alliance. You have to be real, you have to be honest, and you have to be planful and say, this is what this process is, uh, this is what the potential is, this is how we could use it. You know, if you're not sure, let's check it out. You know, have try it out. Let's see if this works for you. And it needs to have a purpose. You have to see, and when I've worked in private practice over the years has really taught me a lot about ensuring that you have a purpose. When someone's paying you for an hour's time, you better be useful. You better have a purpose and you want to use that time uh, to help the person who you're with. Uh, so you need to have goals, and you, you need to have collaborative goals, not goals that are therapist-driven goals. They have to be collaborative, and they have to be meaningful from the individual who you're seeing. And you have to be clear on the time frame. You know, if, let's say a student's working with someone, well, I'm only here for three months or something. This is the time we have. You know, we can meet these amount of times. These are our parameters if there are limits or this is what we can do. This is how long we can meet. This is how often. Because that influences what we do. If we think, oh, we've only got a month and that means I can see you once or twice a week, that's only maybe four or eight sessions, it's going to be a very different process than if you're going to see someone ongoing indefinitely or for a year or something. There's a whole different process of, uh, of comfort. And I added this slide that I try to add in almost everything now about what works in therapy. There's a great uh, psychologist, Scott Miller uh, from Chicago, who he's a therapist, but he's primarily a researcher. And he's done incredible research, looking over about 40 years of research about what works in therapy. Because what works in art therapy is the same as what works in any kind of therapy. And he's looked at every kind of treatment, alcohol stuff, substance use, mental health issues, all kinds of things, and pulled it down to look at what matters. Is it the program? Is it the experience of the therapist? Is it their training? Is it the approach? And boiled it all down. And what he concluded, he's got a website, got all kinds of really good data there. But he says that 87% of the factors that happen in our lives are not influenced by treatment or like psychological treatment or therapy. We, we can't um, shift those things. There are circumstances, stuff that happens. But we have influence as a therapist on about 13% out of that 100%.
So out of the 13%, the most important thing above absolutely everything else is therapeutic alliance. And it's not therapeutic alliance as uh, concluded by the therapist. It's therapeutic alliance defined by the client, which is different. And he concluded that therapists actually do not have uh, a good uh, view about whether they have an alliance or not. And as I said ali earlier, alliance is not static. You don't just meet with someone and decide we've got an alliance. It changes. You can have alliance for a while and then maybe you get into a conversation about something and that trust uh, diminishes, goes down. So from day to day, uh, session to session, the alliance is, has to be primary. And that's where all those things about confidentiality and respect and openness and honesty, transparency, they're critical pieces of alliance. So if, if you're saying that we have confidentiality, if that has to be broken, uh, you have to tell them right at the very, very first session, what are the reasons that you'd have to breach confidentiality? Safety issues are the primary one, right? And uh, so if there are things, or if you're working in a hospital and you're going to be discussing things with a team, you need to be honest about what you discuss and tell the person what kind of things are going to be revealed about the conversations that you have. I used to do my recording uh, at Children's Hospital uh, for years and years in a narrative style which is transparent and as a letter to the clients. And I did it in family therapy and in individual therapy and that's what would go on the chart and the client would receive a copy. That took a long time to develop that in a, in a system of a hospital. And a lot of the professionals are very skeptical of that. They don't necessarily like doing notes that everybody's going to see. But that's what builds the trust, and why not? That's who we're accountable to, is the person that we're there for. And it worked. It worked beautifully. And once the team starts seeing how these recordings can work, then uh, they start to appreciate it and start to think about Recording practices don't have to be top-down. So the 60% is that alliance. 30% is the therapist's allegiance to their approach. So it doesn't mean you have no approach that you just focus on therapeutic alliance. You have to know therapeutically what you're doing. But the most important part of that is not your modality or your technique, which is only 8%. It's how much you believe that your approach is useful and effective. Uh, I'll give you an example, a personal one. Um, when I say I, I've been in the eating disorder program before it was even an eating disorder program. I also worked in other areas of the hospital, but during all that time, I watched what happened in terms of treatment and where things went, and you know the approaches shifted from this approach to that approach. And several years ago, an approach was developed and researched called family-based therapy. It became developed and then manualized by some folks in the States based on a, a, a British uh, model. And I was very skeptical about the manualizing of this model. I believed in the principles of the model and knew that they were effective because of clinical experience, but I thought, oh, I don't know if you can manualize this kind of stuff and say, you know, you really have to focus on this and this and this. And our team went through a whole training thing. We had lots of people coming in, we had clinical supervision, and I was still really skeptical. But I decided, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it, and I'm going to see what happens. I have to see, I felt I had to know whether this worked for the clients before I would accept it. And so I tried it. And it had profound effects for a certain population, not everybody, but a very specific population. And so once I went through that transformation of not just being trained in it, but actually seeing that this could produce some very good results, then my heart went into that. And I got better and better at that and adapted it in a way that I could really believe in it because I saw the results and I knew how to work with that. So that was a personal um, experience of how you transform uh, your approaches and beliefs to something that you really have to believe it's effective. You know, for example, again, in eating disorders, I've had colleagues who will say, oh, you know, in eating disorders like alcoholism, you, uh, 
you're always going to have to be sensitive and careful. And that's not true at all. The statistics don't show that. And my clinical experience doesn't show that. You can 100% get rid of an eating disorder, 100%. Uh, and it doesn't have to linger. It doesn't have to become a, a sensitivity. It doesn't have to become a chronic illness. And because of seeing this for so many years and seeing people who fully recovered and never looked back, uh, I knew it, that it's true and I believe in it because I've seen it and experienced it. Whereas I think, well, how do other people give hope to their clients? Because you talked about hope, Luke, right? How do you give hope if you have that frame of reference? That you're working with somebody you actually believe that they can't 100% get through this problem. How does that influence your belief in what you do and how does that translate into the therapy and what you do in that hour? I added this years ago, like probably like 25 years ago, somebody gave me this cartoon and I kept it. It was, I don't even know where they got it. And so this therapist or whatever says, oh yes, Joni's parents, I recognize you from her drawings. And it's so relevant. When you're working with children and teenagers, parents have a lot of fears that they're going to be revealed. What are they going to say about me? Are they, am I going to be in there? You know, work whether it's verbal or um, art, but especially art, because it gives something concrete, right? That someone might draw something about a family conflict or portray somebody in a particular way. And so, therapeutic alliance with children and teenagers. Is also has to include the family. If you don't develop the trust with the family, then they won't bring the kids for therapy and they won't um, portray the therapy to their youth as being helpful. They'll have skepticism and doubt and that will mean that the kids can't trust the therapist because they're more aligned with their family, right? They're just getting to know this process. So it's imperative that uh, parents understand what's happening. They understand confidentiality. They understand uh, what can be revealed, what not, you know, deal, deal with issues of interpretation and all that stuff. So what I'd like to do, because we couldn't do an experiential thing given this room, right, and the, the issues. What I'd like you to do is just think about yourselves for a minute. Just take a minute and imagine that you're going to have an art therapy session. Your very first one is coming up for some kind of problem that you might be facing. doesn't matter what. Just think of something that's a challenge in your life. And it's been recommended to you that you have some art therapy and you're going to be meeting with this person. Could you tell me just a little bit, maybe touch the microphones or put your hand up and touch the microphones on what things come into your mind? What do you get afraid of? What do you worry about? Any thoughts? What would, would it feel totally wonderful? Would you be excited? Would you be scared? Would you be, you know, any thoughts? We'll go through your mind. Yeah? It's most of all if fear is the first thing that comes to mind. And you had to open up and like look inside yourself and see what's inside you. Yeah. So that's a, an interesting fear, isn't it? Fear that you're going to have to look at yourself. Right? That there's going to be some. And a lot of people don't think that that's a scary thing, but it is. One of the hardest things we do is learn about ourselves. It's much easier to blame somebody else or think about something else. It's much harder to reveal yourself. Right? That's why it's easier for me to give the talk than Luke. <laughs> right? Um, so, yeah. Any other thoughts that would come to your mind? Things you might be afraid of or worried about? Or... Yeah? Did Luke, did you guys have a comment over there? Oh, yeah? Okay. I was just thinking how um, I feel like I'm getting judged. I'm afraid yes. of being judged. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A fear that somebody is going to uh, make, conclude, draw conclusions about who you are or what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Fear of being judged. Okay. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mine was the same too, is that you actually need help. 
Right. Yeah. So that brings up a sense of, oh, I actually need help. Maybe, um, maybe I'm not strong enough. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm inadequate or what's wrong with me. And, and you get that a lot in therapy. Like we put a lot of energy into our physical health, you know, both as a, a culture, we put the money there versus mental health. And we have a view that that's okay to get help for your physical problems, but that you're weak or, or something if you can't handle the emotional stuff that goes on in life. But we don't teach kids how to do it. It's not taught in schools or, you know, although you can hear uh, from Dr. Vo, who some of these things around mindfulness are actually starting to get taught in schools. And so it's, it's not an easy process. So when you think about what might you be fearful of, uh, what, what materials would you feel most comfortable with? Any thoughts about that? If someone said, okay, here I am, we're going to do some art. What would, what would feel most comfortable to people? Any thoughts about that? Play-Doh. Any, what, what would be Play-Doh? How, did, how does that feel? Okay. So you'd be drawn to the something you can touch, and yeah, yeah, and that's really personal too. Right? Some people like that kind of material; other people, no way, right? Any other thoughts about? Yeah, I think anything to do with colors. I think colors provide a lot of different feelings. Like uh, um, something like a felt pen or something like that, Either or anything or that has or anything to do with colors, anything or balls or anything. yeah, okay. So that would be something that would increase comfort for you to have colors. Yeah. Yeah? Paper mache. Was that paper, paper mache? mache? Building yeah. something from nothing. The texture, I guess, of yeah. from different wet to dry, the feeling of different, to make something, to know right. how a person has created something of their own. Right. From paper mache from is lovely, a lovely yeah. tool. Imagination to real life. Right. So a lot of people think art therapy is about drawing and, that, and painting, and you have to make representational stuff. And I try to dispel that with people. You don't have to be able to draw. You don't do anything that has to look real. You know, it doesn't have to look like a tree or a person or anything. You don't ever have to do that. You can just use colors and lines and make things. And, and, uh, and so finding out where people's comfort level is, is important because you gave really different things about what gives you comfort, right? What, what's easier. It's not a global thing. Um, and what do you think would make you feel more at ease? Any thoughts about that? It's this new situation. What would stand out for you to help you feel a bit more comfortable? I think yeah. like I, um, I would feel more comfortable having music playing or like I find music. music comforting and you know sometimes inspirational and so something about the setting yeah the setting yeah so that's where if you have control over the setting it's really nice you can do things that uh, in the structure that can help you know in terms of the way things are set up and all that kind of stuff whereas with hospitals were yeah very environment limited. I think environment is really important yeah. because if you brought into this room and it's just all white right. or I think the, the comfort yes, yeah. environment plays, or your indoor or outdoor. 